Hey everyone, welcome to week four. Today we're going to be looking, we're going to have two different lessons, and the first one is going to be looking at the anatomy of a web page. Uh, this is going to be based off of the reading for this week on Above the Fold, and we're really going to look at how sites are structured uh, physically, whereas last week we were looking at the architecture uh, from the sitemap of how the different pieces put together. Today we're going to look at an actual website and look at the different pieces of the puzzle that actually make that come together. So users have certain expectations when they visit a website, expectations that if not met could result in them having trouble understanding how it works. Therefore it's, under, it's important that websites are designed so that users can predict how things will work and where certain elements will be. So think about in life we see one-way streets or stop signs or stop lights and we immediately understand what we're supposed to do when we see those types of directions. And it's pretty global, it doesn't matter what city you're in or what state you're in. When you see a street sign, you instinctually understand the type of direction it's supposed to give you. And the same thing goes with a car. Every single car makes and models, they're all different and they have different buttons and the interior is a little bit different, but Generally, when you get into a car, you know how to use it. And imagine if every single time you got into a car, you had to relearn the process of driving. How frustrating would that be and how difficult would that be? So we really want to take this example and bring it to web design. Every time a user comes to a website, we don't want them to relearn how to use the website. We want them to really basically understand where the important things are that they have to get to and how to use them efficiently. So we're going to look at a couple things today that has brought us to the certain conventions that have been developed in regards to the anatomy of a website. So the first web page was built in 1992 and you can see that there were a lot of restrictions just certainly based on the technology. We have a basic text website using a serif font and all the links are in blue and the layout is pretty straightforward and pretty standard in terms of just a text document on the web. So as a Western culture we generally read from left to right top to bottom and there have been a lot of studies um, with cameras on top of computers that can track eye motion to get a sense of how people actually read websites and what people have found is generally people read websites in what's called the F shape. So if you look at all three of these examples, you can see the red is where the eyes have stayed the longest on the page. And you can see in all three examples that an F shape has been made. So when people come to the website, they generally start in the top left corner. So that's where we're going to want to put our logo, branded content information, because when you land to a website, boom, that's where your eyes go. And generally, we, we read left to right, and then we come down a little bit on the page and go left to right again, and then come down on the page a little bit on the left, and it generally fits an F shape. So when we're starting to design the actual architecture of our pages, we want to consider that F shape to make sure a lot of the most important content information is in the top left corner and then bleeds down. So again, coming back to the limits of technology, I want to just take a look at how the architecture of the site Yahoo has evolved over time. So here at its beginning in the early 90s, we have a really basic website with basic links in blue bulleted list listing out the different types of content inside of Yahoo. Now as the technology advanced we were able to create more complex grid systems starting to add images um, and you can start to see we have a sidebar, head bar, main content area and then as the technology continued to grow we were able to design something that was a lot more full and expansive. So here we have different banners, we have ads, lots of different links, lots of different images, and a lot of information going on at the same time. 
Here we have one of the early MTV sites, and you can tell here that basically the site was limited based on browser technology. So as the newer browsers came out, so for this example, Internet Explorer 3.0 or Netscape Navigator 3.0, if you didn't have those specific browsers, you really weren't able to visit and get the best experience of the website that MTV was intending to have. And it took a long time for users to buy into these special browsers to really take advantage of the technology that was available. And then here, an example of the old, old Apple website. You can see if you look at the Apple website now, how far technology has allowed the, the browsing experience to come. But here, you know, are still a really clean, simple design focusing on three main products and has its branding in the upper left corner. And then we can come down and see the main items below. So something that we've taken from print into interactivity is this idea of above the fold. And I'm sure that you've probably heard this before, um, but it was taken from print. So newspapers wanted to make sure that all their top headlines and all their most important content was, the above, was above the fold of the newspaper. So that way when the newspapers were all stacked and you could only see the top half of the front page, you wanted to make sure that all that important content was above that crease where the newspaper folded in half. And this concept is really taken into interactive platforms. And so you'll see that a lot of websites try to make sure that the most important content is quote unquote above the fold. Now there is no fold on a website they just scroll and they can scroll infinitely. Um, but generally, the fold hits at around 600 pixels from the top down. That's considered the fold. So any type of important information that you want people to see when they first get to your website without scrolling, you're going to want to make sure is 600 pixels or below or above 600 pixels to 5, to 4, to 3, to 2, to 1, so coming up the page to make sure that viewers see that when they hit your website. Um, and then here's another, um, this is an app called Flipbook, which some of you may have for your iPhones or your iPads, and it pulls in news sources, social media, and the thing that they've really done that ta is taken from, you know, physical physical objects is this idea of the page flip. So as you flip through the app, the page is actually flipped to give you the experience like you're reading a book. Um, and a lot of apps actually do this. So advertising has actually played a really large role into the development of how we structure websites now. Advertising is really important. A lot of websites really need this. It's a really strong revenue for them and allows them to have platforms that are very profitable. And there's a bunch of standard ad sizes um, that you'll see on the web. A lot of them are skinny banners that go up the top or up and down, or we have these medium rectangles. But these standards that have been developed have really structured how websites are built because you don't want to have 80,000 different sizes ads because companies are only going to want to produce the standard ads and then put them into your website. So you want to make sure that you allocate space for these standard size ads in the architecture and structure of your site. So there have been a lot of trends in web design and Certain people or certain designers or certain companies have established certain trends and then other companies have adapted to this. So one of the old trends here was to have a nav bar at the top. We have a nav bar at the bottom with our main content in the center. And this has been a trend that's really stuck around but has become finessed or elevated as time goes on. So you can see that Adobe then and now has somewhat of a similar structure with the nav bar at the top and the main content right underneath that. Um, but now it's a much, much more elegant feel. One of the trends from the early 90s that Amazon really started was this tabbed concept. So at the very top, you see that we have the different tabs, welcome, books, music, video, toys, and games. And this was pulled from the idea of file folders, something that users were very, very familiar with in the physical realm. And so they decided to implement that in a digital realm to give the sense that there's a lot more content underneath and each folder has a bunch of content inside of that.
Amazon since has moved away from the tabbed idea and focused on a more open layout with featured content to highlight lots of their products. Um, MTV back in the 90s, uh, you know, was into this really techy look, a lot of different colors for their links that focused on different types of content. Um, but now, we have a much cleaner concept. We have a nice skinny banner, lots of detailed information underneath. But MTV has even pushed further into a much more open, clean aesthetic with a lot of white space, a moving carousel at the top that cycles through all their different shows, and then underneath focusing on the featured music videos and the featured music. Now, Nike has come a long way since some of their earlier websites. Here we have a website from uh, 1999, and you can see that the architecture of it is a little confusing. We have a side navigation on the bottom, and as you would click those links, the content would populate in the center. But the site was very, very small and stuck up in that top left corner. As they evolved, they moved out from that top left corner and centered all their content, creating a more modular site, where as you would click on the different links, the boxes in the center would change. But this wasn't a very flexible website because it was really all geared towards one specific size, the box that Nike had defined. So they decided to break out of that box, and here they created a bottom navigation that focuses on their different products and a gallery almost like the cover flow from Apple that we're all very familiar with was highlighted in the center creating like a cinematic feel. But then now like a lot of the trends in websites they decided to open up their website and really focus on lightness, a lot of white space, a big banner at the top with content underneath. A much more open elegant feel. So now we're going to look at the different components that most websites are built from. Now we say most sites because this is the standard template that a lot of websites follow, but by no means is this the only way that you can design a website. And as we go in throughout the semester, I'm going to encourage you to kind of break those boundaries because I don't think that every website needs to fit this formula. But this is the basic uh, architecture and structure of the site that we're going to look at today. So we're going to start with the header. Now there's a lot of important information that lies in the header. And most specifically, and as you can see as we talked about earlier in this lesson, the logo is in the top left corner because boom, that's where our eyes go right away because that's how we read left to right. Other information that lies in the header is really dependent on the website. But here for the NPR website, we have the logo, we have our main navigation, we have a search bar, we have a donate button to support public radio, um, we have a login and register, we have a shop, and above the logo in the top left corner we have the date. So Mayo Clinic uh, has a very different approach. They just have a very simple clean nav bar with our logo in the dead center with the main navigation around the logo within a sub navigation below that with little links to the social media. Here the Guardian, I'm going to show you two examples of their header. Um, here we have their logo, we have their navigation which looks, which looks at the different types of news. We even have the weather so it's picking up our geolocation and showing us what the, um, speaking of weather, it's starting to rain, so, and I'm sitting outside, so I have to go inside so my computer doesn't get wet. Sorry about that. Speaking of weather, perfect timing. Hold on, just one second, class. So you can notice that we also have the search, and the search right now is set to search the Guardian website, but you can also drop down and search it with your favorite browser. Um, but if you go to an interior page, you notice that they lose the um, they lose the weather because that's probably not as important when you're navigating within the site. Hold on one second, I'm just going to sit 
down. Okay, so, and here's MoMA's website, which some of you may have visited in one of our earlier assignments, but this is an older version of MoMA. But you can see that their header takes up a huge part of the website. And the reason for that is because they're really showcasing the exhibit that's currently at the museum. So they're using the header as an opportunity to really highlight the work that's going on within the museum. So the next piece of content that we're going to look at is the featured area. And this is the content that generally sits right below the header. So here we have the red cross and we have a general slider that is going to slide through that shows the main content of the red cross or the featured content that they want to highlight. And here it's a bunch of stories from the Red Cross. Evernote, this is a great website, uh, and they also have great apps. And so they use the featured content area to really showcase the user flow of why you would want to use their products. And then right underneath that, they have a bunch of different apps that you can click on, and it'll take you directly to the App Store. Marquetta, this is a great example of a really big chunky header that uses really beautiful photography. And you can see underneath they have five little dots that let you that indicate that there's five different pieces of featured content. So we know that that's going to scroll through. And just based off of this one, I imagine that all of them are big and bright and colorful with really fantastic illustration. And here, every blocks, this is an example where the featured content highlights a bunch of illustrations. So there's a lot of personality that's added into this, along with four different links that are going to give you a little insight on how the platform works. So the next thing we're going to look at is the body content. Um, this is really the meat of the website. So here on Amnesty International, we have the human rights update. So this is going to be a blog format. And the body content is going to highlight all the different blog posts in the website. And they're just going to go down chronologically. Here's an example of the American Cancer Society. And we see that their body content, there's three different chunks that are going to take you into three different sections of the website. Here, the New York Times, many of you may have looked at this in the earlier homework assignment. The body content here is really the links to the uh, internal articles. And the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the body content is really broken up into hours. We have three different columns. The first one is how to visit the museum, what the different hours are, how to get tickets, how to join a membership. Then we have the middle column, which is looking at all the different events that are going on at the museum. And then the column all the way to the right is the current exhibits that are happening and what, what could happen today if you went and visited the museum. So the next thing we're going to look at is the sidebar. There's a lot of different content that we could put in here and it really varies depending on the type of site that you're designing. Um, here the example of the World Bank, the sidebar is all the way on the right. Um, they have two little links that are going to take you to internal pages on the site, and they've designed very special visual graphics for what those links will look like. Um, we have a little newsletter sign up, and then we have a social media little box that's going to connect you to their different social media. This site is probably built on a content management system called WordPress, and they call these little boxes in the sidebar widgets. So here's an example of the sidebar on the left-hand side. We don't see this very frequently, mostly because of that F pattern that we talked about earlier. But in this example, we have become a member, sign in, or log in with Facebook. Um, we have our social media stream. We have a little advertisement from a sponsor, and then a link to download their app. And then finally, we're going to look at the footer of the website. There have been a lot of trends in footer design, and here's a great example from TED. 
uh, the website that houses all the TED Talks. And this is an example of what I like to call a really chunky footer. Um, footers can generally hold information that take you to the latest articles if you're posting, if you have like a blog type website. Um, or it could be information that's housed about the company or the organization, including social media links. Here's another example of a chunky footer that has a list of all the interior pages on the website. This is a website about birds. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about is the actual background of the website. So we talked about all the specific elements of the content, but then what are all those elements sitting on? And there's a lot of different things that we can do. So here's an example of an image that's used as the background of the website to give a sense of feeling or environment. And Vimeo uses a solid color for the background of their website. They use this dark grayish blue. Um, but then once you get internally into the site, the background is white. So this is using a solid color. And then the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston is using a image of art as their background. And this image would scale with your browser. So as your browser got smaller, the image would scale proportionately. The same thing with baking it bigger. And um, there are other things you can do. You can have patterns, seamless patterns, um, photographs, solid colors. And we're going to look a lot more into that when we start actually visually designing the website. So that's the basic uh, architecture and anatomy of the website. And uh, now when you start viewing websites online, I want you to start looking at the different components that build it up and how all those different pieces fit together. Okay, thanks.